Welcome to Behind the Investigation, with me, your host, Anna Covriarado. This is a podcast about the HBO Limited series, The Investigation, that tells the previously untold story of the extraordinary work that went into solving the 2017 murder of Swedish journalist Kim Ball. We're on episode five, and last time we learned about the real police investigation and all of the exceptionally hard work that went into solving this case. But how do you begin to adapt a true story like this for the screen? And how do you tell the story of such awful events with authenticity, but also with compassion and humanity? The writer and director, Tobias Lindholm, joins me on the show to explain just that. Before we hear from Tobias, just a quick reminder that this podcast does deal with some distressing themes of violent crime. And while the TV show is based on real events, there are spoilers ahead. Tobias, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you, Anna. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. In one of the earlier episodes, you told us how you didn't go out with the intention of making this story. It almost found you in a way. It was after meeting Jens and then Ingrid and Joachim Wahl that you felt you had to tell this untold story of the professionalism and heroism of the people who solved the case of Kim Wahl's killing. When the seeds of the idea for the series started to form, can you tell us what you really wanted to achieve with it? What fascinated me from the beginning and what surprised me from the beginning was the unexpected humanity of the story that Jens and Inge and Joachim shared with me. And I wanted that to be reflected in the final story in the series. And that became my goal. And that, of course, also became a struggle with the genre um, of crime shows. Normally, a crime show would offer the obvious, the crime, details from the crime, interviews with a perpetrator, the excitement cat after the mouse game where a police officer is chasing a criminal and finally being smarter, stronger or faster than the criminal and catching the criminal. In this case, as in the real world, from day one, they had a person under arrest. They just didn't know for what. And that's a very strange engine in a story. Especially when we're talking about a story from real life, because we all know the ending. You know, everybody knew that he had been to court. Everybody knew that he was sentenced. Uh, so that was not a surprise. And nevertheless, the question became not, how do I make this thrilling enough? As you normally would ask yourself as a writer of a crime story. In this case, I would ask myself, how do I make this humane enough? Because that was the new element. That was the new thing that we added to the table of crime stories was the humanity that Inge, Joachim and Jens had told me about. So that became the goal. That became my thing. I just, I didn't hunt excitement. I hunted humanity. Do you feel like you achieved that goal? I feel like I did the best I could to achieve that goal. I think it's up to the audience to decide whether it's achieved or not. Um, I do believe that we succeeded. We succeeded in narrowing down our expressions to the most necessary parts. I felt like any punchline in this show would easily be too much. We were so focused on telling a serious, real story. We restrained ourselves from picking the obvious fruits and instead trying to find qualities where we normally wouldn't go. Qualities in just images of Jens waiting in a car that for me would represent an offer to get inside his head in his real life just slowly moving the camera towards our characters, offering the audience the possibility of being that character for that moment. Um, normally, I would, with a handheld camera, go out and try to chase the expression of reality. The fact that normally with a handheld camera, what you do is you're chasing the unplanned. So you're trying to build the illusion that this is happening while we're filming, like a documentary. A 
of course it's not it's all planned and, and scripted and everything but nevertheless the handheld camera offers that illusion in this case everybody knew that this wasn't happening as we were looking at it everybody knew that knew that this was some sort of a reconstruction so instead of using a handheld camera that would go out there and hunt the truth from a practical point of view we would offer a more static slow moving camera that would offer the humane side of the story the identification with the characters um and slowly methods like that were built up um to help us uh, get to where we wanted so in so many moments of the series i feel that we achieved that but whether the series in itself and whether the story in itself achieved that is up to the audience i think that raises a really big question that i think a lot of people will have is why fiction first of all fiction is my language i am a a, a writer of fiction um and i believe that fiction in many ways has been captured in the idea that fiction is there to entertain and it should be that as well but not just that fiction has the opportunity of offering the audience the possibility of being somebody else for a while more precise than any other storytelling or art form that's because of identification i do believe that fiction offers identification better than anything else because we can plan what we want the audience to see so that we trick them to believe that they are there that they identify very closely and then we can start to tell a fascinating story often in documentaries that i am a huge fan of you will start with a fascinating subject and then slowly you will start to identify with characters for me fiction can work the other way around with a boring everyday life beginning just meeting some people that you could meet in real life and then slowly by becoming them joining them on their journey um the journey being the story we're telling so 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 that's why fiction has a uh, a part to play in this world not only as entertainment but also as a reflection of the life we're living that's fiction i think also from a practical point of view presumably that mode also allowed you to really push the boundaries of what you could do with the show for example the fact that we never even see the perpetrator whereas perhaps in another format that would have been a lot harder to do is there an practical element as well to how fiction can really push a story forward for the viewer i i think you could be on to to something there but uh, but but let's imagine that we were there just to celebrate the work of the professionals not there to humanize the story but just there to tell the fascinating story of the professional work that was behind this we could have done that in a very traditional documentary with talking heads and a bit of footage coverage from news and so on and it could have been great the humanity we offer comes from the fiction when we are allowed to study the expressions of penela august when we are allowed to spend time with Jens Müller alone in his car in his drive when we are allowed to plan conversations that he has with his daughter or with his his wife or with his colleagues so the humanity that Jens and Inge and Joachim represented for me found its way into the story by making it into fiction because i could control the details that we told about them and i could make sure that it at least represented my idea of who these people are. So let's talk a bit more about those techniques. So what's really fascinating about the show is that there is actually a a subplot almost about Jens's own relationship with his daughter and there are some really moving scenes between his character and and his daughter and the tension that they have in their relationship. How does telling this in a fictionalized way allow you to build that neat narrative in a way that perhaps a documentary wouldn't have done it is a very controlled and planned order of beats that you will feed the audience and thereby 
making sure that you're telling them the story you want to tell. So the order of what you're telling, when, how um, are you telling this? In making the investigation, I needed to understand these beats from these real living people's real lives and then treat it as I was looking at it as a real life retrospect, looking at those beats and connecting them. When I listened to Jens's story and I listened to the story of Ingrid and Joachim, I, and I understood that the friendship between Jens and Joachim became important for the investigation because Joachim would take part in it. It's impossible to look past that Jens has a daughter who is the exact same age as Kim. So now we're not talking about a police officer and a griefing father anymore. We're talking about two men that both have daughters. One is missing his daughter because she is uh, because she's dead. The other one is missing his daughter because he is not paying enough attention to her. It would be impossible to look by that and not try to use it in the story because it explains the friendship. It explains why this had a very emotional effect on Jens Müller. It explains why it became his last case. It explains so many things in the understanding of those circumstances. So that became part of the story. Now, of course, I, in my fictionalization of this, have made choices to place certain conversations between Jens and his daughter on certain dates to make sure that the audience could follow. So basically, what I was doing is making fictionalized beats of their lives and just placing them in an order so that the audience could follow the logic of the friendship between Jens and Joachim. They were both fathers to daughters. They were both on their way to becoming grandfathers and they were both in a situation where they needed to evaluate who they were as men, as fathers, as professionals in this world. You've worked on crime series before, including Mindhunter, and you have yourself have said in a previous episode of this podcast that the investigation is polar opposite in style to shows like Mindhunter. Why was it important to you to challenge the crime genre in the way that you did on this show? I don't know if the investigation is the opposite of any other crime show than Mindhunter, but the Exciting thing for me was that this is the exact opposite of Mindhunter. Mindhunter is, in its concept, a study of the criminal, the perpetrator, and a hunt to understand. The investigation is the opposite since we have locked in the perpetrator and we never meet him. We never talk about him. We don't mention his name and we never really study his behavior at all. We only talk about the evidence found out there by investigators. Uh, so in that way, it was the exact opposite. And that excited me. When the concept started to grow, I believed that it was enough to just look at these police officers and investigators and listen to what they were saying. And by placing in the right order, I could make it exciting. The big difference is that we are not in the investigation paying attention to the perpetrator at all. That came from two things. One, practically, Jens did not uh, uh, interrogate the perpetrator, so he offered me that opportunity. Had I done a series about Jens's life and then just edited out all the scenes where he was confronting the perpetrator, I would have been close to lying. But because he never did, the possibility was there and we took it. The investigation is my effort to confront some of the weaknesses in the crime genre as we see it today. And people find it radical. How can you make a crime story without the perpetrator? And the basic answer is, if a chief of investigation can solve the crime without ever meeting the perpetrator, we definitely can tell the story 
about the solving of the crime without meeting the perpetrator. So by doing something as simple as removing our attention and fascination from the perpetrator to the police, we made something provocative and very radical. And I find that interesting. Why do we so desperately want to try to understand the perpetrator? Why do we need the darkness so much? What, what does that tell about us and about our society? I think that's an important question to ask. And I think that, that by not doing that, we are asking that question. I think it's a real comment on the world that we live in right now, that the idea of focusing a show on the humanity and the light rather than darkness is a radical act. And the, the fact that something that actually seeks to find, I, I don't want to say the good in people, but something that seeks to find the humanity is somehow radical. That's, that's quite a big thought. And it really, really says a lot about where we are right now, just even thinking about that. Let's talk a bit about the actual making of the series. Can you tell us where it was shot and how long you were filming for? The investigation was shot from mid-August um, and until the 22nd or 23rd of December. We did that to make sure that we would have the right time of year uh, to portray when this story was playing out. So basically we could go out and do all the exteriors in its natural light, in its natural uh, environment. We would shoot it on location in Copenhagen and in the ocean surrounding Copenhagen. And we would shoot it uh, partly in Sweden when we were portraying Ingel and Joachim in their home. You've told us in previous episodes that the real life Jens and also Ingrid and Joachim would often be on set. What was that like in terms of the atmosphere? What was the atmosphere on set like? Um, I would say that all the real people, all the experts that helped us during this shoot, a lot of them were on set when we were shooting or portraying their part of the story. As I've tried before, it gave a very respectful and very focused atmosphere on set. I don't believe I've ever tried to shoot that focus before, especially when we were shooting in the... Uh, when we were portraying the lives of Ingrid and Joachim in their home in, in Sweden. Of course, it wasn't their real home, but we would, uh, you know, make, make a home for them this serious version of their home. Um, we were all leaving our shoes outside and I would spend a lot of time in the morning briefing the crew on the scenes we were doing so that everybody knew everything from the beginning. There was no questions to ask during the day. We needed to move some light once in a while, but other than that, we could allow the actors to just focus on the portray that they were fighting to do. That was extraordinary. And of course, that became even more focused the days Ingrid and Joachim was there because then suddenly the actors knew that the real-life people they were portraying was by my monitor looking at it. Um, and that gave a very, in the beginning, uh, nervous, but later on very respectful and very emotional uh, effect. There are also, in the show real people in the TV series. So the divers and also the police dogs are the real divers and police dogs, which is something that we've covered in a previous episode. But how did that also add to the atmosphere and the makeup of the crew and team of actors that made this series? I am lucky enough, you know, I, I, I surround myself. I believe, let me put it this way. I've always felt that when you work as hard as you do on a film crew, shooting for many, many hours, you need to make sure that it's a familiar and nice atmosphere. So my biggest pride in this is that the first movie I did, I believe we're still nine or ten people from that group that have continued together in front and behind the camera ever since, and we also did the investigation and everything in between together. And that creates a certain atmosphere of safety and comfort, even though 
it also feels uh, hard and 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 emotional. So, from the beginning in the in the, in, in the courtroom in episode one, when um, the the character that Pilu Asbeck is playing, Jakob Gibson, who was the prosecutor of this case that worked very closely with Jens Müller, uh, when they are finishing another case and losing it, uh, we shot that in the courtroom where the trial uh, in the in the murder case of Kimbal was held. So already from the beginning, we were introducing to everybody in the crew the idea that we were very close to reality. We would have a real judge that day that would sit there and take control of the courtroom. And from the beginning, that gave a very professional and respectful attitude. So I, I think that if you ask anybody from the film crew, they had a great time doing this. And they never tried anything as serious as this. And that's that's a complex situation. Now, bringing in the real divers gave us a certainty that we were doing things correctly. So everybody felt safer. When we were racing the submarine in episode one, we did it in cooperation with that real ship that actually did that job in the real case. That's the real crew on that ship that did it in the real case. And all these elements just created an atmosphere of seriousness and making sure that we were doing things right. Nobody didn't care. Everybody cared. And everybody started to take that responsibility, making sure that they were prepared, making sure that we got things right. Um, and that helped us in the long end when we were starting to get tired, closer and closer to Christmas. As the divers in real life, uh, we were also navigating in darker and darker uh, environment, colder and colder environment, and getting tired. Uh, but but all these real experts from real life, including England, Joachim and Iso, uh, would energize and focus uh, the film crew. Something that's really beautiful in the show is the musical score. And there's um, some music in there from an artist that I'm a huge fan of, Agnes Obel. Would you be able to tell us briefly about the musical score? In my first ideas of this uh, TV series, when it started to materialize into six episodes and the idea of a limited series like this, I had the idea that every episode should end with an unknown female Scandinavian artist that would sing a song that we have never heard before. The idea was, of course, to uh, represent uh, Kim in some way. Um, as we started to work with it, I realized that it would lock in the story and it would end the episodes too much instead of connecting the episodes. So that idea uh, died. But one thing that didn't die was my fascination and love for the music of Arnus Opel. Luckily, my wife and producer uh, are friends with Arnus, and I've met her many times before. We both worked on Thomas Winterberg's movie the, uh, called A Submarino. Um, so Caroline would, would call Arnus and ask her if it was okay that we used this music. And of course, my editor, who's always into trouble, would fall in love with a version that he found on YouTube from a live act. And he convinced me that that version was the only right version of one of her numbers to use. So we were trying to figure out whether we should stage a new live act and go record that. And then I believe Aunus told my wife that she had actually recorded that. And it also was her favorite version of that number. So they sent it to us. We put it in and it was there. So the idea came from the this naive maybe and too obvious idea of having uh, 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 female singers to end each episode but nevertheless we used that idea in episode five and six as uh, we we get closer closer to the ending the rest of the score is composed by this wonderful danish classical educated composer called uh, rune who had done very little uh, uh, music to films before but my editor had worked with him and he showed out to be probably the biggest talent to do this that I've ever met and he would write all of the rest of the music in the investigation and in my mind he would create the emotional invitation that the rest of the scenes benefits from so I owe a lot to to the to the 
to the hard work of 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 him and um I'm very pleased and hopefully we can keep him here in Denmark for a while so I get the chance to work with him again but as I've told him I am afraid that he will get kidnapped by Hollywood very soon In the very final scene of the series we see Ingrid going into a school and delivering a talk can you tell us about that scene and the school and how that was shot I have to admit that I would wish that I was the type of writer who would write until I was certain that it was perfect and then go out and shoot it in this case I had written a different ending for Ingrid during shooting the first half of the series all the searching and all the parts that would be in the light of the late summer i would realize that it was too small emotionally of an ending that i had and getting to know ingrid i suddenly realized that the strength that she had and she offered was not reflected in the ending i had already so i needed to write something so i would start a a conversation with ingrid about I remember asking her if you had the last word in this case what do you want to say and we talked about that and then I came up with the idea because she is keeping she is making speeches she is uh, uh teaching in her own experiences the book she wrote and the life and work of Kim and then I realized that the perfect ending would be her on stage speaking to an audience and the audience So we found uh, a high school or gymnasium in Trelleborg, their hometown, and Ingrid knew that school. And then we went there. And I have to admit, I've I haven't yet been on a location and just been in love with it immediately. There's always stuff that you want to discuss. Maybe it's not the right place. Maybe the light is strange. Maybe the seating is wrong. Maybe the the the, the walls have an ugly color. But when we entered this. Lecture hall it was just perfect. The steep blue chairs that were growing up as an ocean in front of the stage. And the stage that was with a whiteboard there reminding us of the offices of the police officers. It was all there when we came. So the only thing we needed to add was a great actress, Penela August, and a speech. So I would sit down and I would have long conversations with Ingrid and Joachim and we would talk about this and then I would go home and try to write a speech that would represent that. I would send that to Ingrid and Joachim. They would read it, they would reflect on it and we would change it again. And then finally on our final day of shooting in Sweden, we were back in this school. And Penilla August went on stage and the real students from that real school populated the room sat down and waited as the audience and ingel and yorkim the real ingel and yorkim would be by my monitor just outside the door and then panella would start to do the speech and for me it was the most heartbreaking thing i've ever been part of i was torn because i was you know half of me was focused on getting Penilla to do it the way that I thought it was best. And the other part of me was focusing on Ingrid and Joachim who was there watching this in the real place in front of real children from their community that was listening to this. I don't really remember that day. It all becomes like a foggy memory of emotions. But I remember getting a phone call a few days later from my editor who was so thrilled normally he's never thrilled normally his eyes are you know on the ball <laughs> uh, reminding me what doesn't work in this case he was just an emotional mess crying and talking to me about the beauty of this shot and then uh, i realized that we had the ending that was fair and did justice to the strong strong ingelva Thank you so much to be us. This was such a fascinating insight into what the behind the scenes of the show has been like. So thank you for sharing all of that with us. It's been an honor and a privilege to share this with you. So thank you so much Anna. You've been listening to Behind the Investigation with me Anna Kodorado. 
A massive thank you to Tobias Lindholm for joining me today to talk about the making of the series. In the next and final episode, I will be speaking with Kim's parents, Ingrid and Joachim Val. We'll get to hear what they think about the TV show and all about the work that they are doing to keep their daughter's legacy alive. Continue to follow the investigation by watching this limited series on HBO and HBO Max. Until then.